Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem and today we'll talk about historical pitch. One of the features introduced by the early music movement was the usage of historical pitches. That is, saying that the internationally accepted standard of A equals 440 Hz is not necessarily appropriate for music from centuries ago, and therefore historical pitches should be used. But is there such a thing as a historical pitch? And do we actually use historical pitch? In this episode, we'll try to find out. To begin with, let's try to imagine a world in which there is no way to accurately measure and really discuss pitch. This was the case until the early 19th century. Let's see. Without any measuring devices, we can only compare pitches or instruments at a given moment. We can say which one is higher or lower, but we cannot exactly say by how much. We can categorize the differences as semitones or tones, but this would be rather inaccurate. As you know, nowadays semitones and tones are absolute units, but this was not at all the case in a world of varying temperaments. Another unit of measure that was far from being standardized is the foot. It was different from city to city throughout Europe, and sometimes even within one city. This caused organs, for example, even if theoretically planned to be identical in their measurements, to be slightly different in size and therefore in pitch. But even if there had been a global measure for the foot or other measuring units, Still, the pitch produced by instruments fluctuates due to many different factors. For example, in organs, and in fact in most wind instruments, the pitch is highly affected by the temperature and wind pressure. Having these things in mind, here is an example of a hypothetical historical conversation about pitch. It was the first day of a particularly cold February when the cornetto player told the organist I think that the organ is a bit lower than it was in the summer. The tired organist exhaled heavily and responded, Well, might be, we cannot really say, and there is nothing we can do about it. Such conversations might have been quite common, especially because the difference in air temperature in churches between the summer and winter changes the organ pitch by up to a semitone. The tuning fork, it was invented in 1711. What did it change? The tuning fork enabled us to have a relatively stable and reproducible pitch that is possible to carry around. It could be used to tune different instruments in different places to the same pitch. Therefore, it is the beginning of the concept of pitch standards. But we are not quite there yet it is still not possible to attribute a number to the pitch of the tuning fork. We can just say that this is a pitch, and as in older times, one could say that other pitches in comparison are higher or lower by an unspecified amount or a rough semitone or tone. Another device from roughly the same time was the pitch pipe, a small pipe that was used as a reference for tuning. In addition to the limitations of the fork, it was also not so stable. This is reported in sources, in addition to the rather funny yet completely true remark that if you happen to lose your pitch pipe, you lose your pitch with it. Devices that actually measure a pitch started to develop only in the first half of the 19th century. Before such devices, the idea of an absolute reference pitch is simply unrealistic even if some treatises writers wished it to be so. Now, already in the second half of the 19th century, scholars began doing research into the issue of historical pitches. However, such research is very challenging. Here are some reasons. 1. There are no stable historical pitch generators. Even those that seem solid, such as organ pipes, without a technical description which includes the temperature and wind pressure, are hardly reliable for a scientific measurement centuries after they were built. This is true for wind instruments in general, 
yet it does not prevent several modern studies to focus on such findings. 2. In general, the corpus of evidence that was collected meticulously since the end of the 19th century is, as put by one scholar, patchy and contradictory. 3. We want everything to be compared with A, so whenever we have a note other than A as evidence, as is often the case with old tuning forks for example, we have to convert it to A according to an assumed temperament. This increases the number of underlying assumptions. 4. Historical textual sources, lacking the ability to refer to an absolute pitch using numbers, build up an intricate web of relativity. For example, pitch X is higher than pitch Y by a semitone, but lower than pitch Z by a tone, and so on. So based on an undefined starting point, we get to other points using inaccurate and unspecific steps of tones and semitones. Often these pitches are assigned with names, such as mezzo punto in tono corista in Italy, or coton and camoton in Germany. Needless to say that different writers were using these terms confusingly differently. 5. Modern research is based on the assumption that at a certain time and place there was a certain specific pitch. But because of the physics of musical instruments, pitches fluctuated, and even within closed ecosystems, different pitches were coexistent. Okay, now we know that the evidence is very hard to work with. So what do we do with it? Science wants to find tendencies and to distill results. However, at the end of the day, the statistical average of pitch evidence does not represent any specific historical situation. In most research, the universal reference point is A equals 440, with steps of equal temperament semitones above and below it. Apart from the fact that equal semitones are an arbitrary choice when dealing with historical contexts, the reduction of the evidence to such a rough grid takes us again further away from truly historical pitches. The early music scene adapted itself to this grid. Dimensions of copies of historical instruments are being scaled to fit the grid of A equals 440 with its equally tempered semitones. Needless to say, these adaptations distance us from the original quality of the instruments. But when was it that we actually started using historical pitches? Unfortunately, we don't have concrete answers. But here are some things we found out about the modern historical pitches. The early music pioneer Arnold Dolmetsch was one of the first to reconstruct instruments according to historical models. And it appears that at least in some cases, he did it at their original pitch. In these cases, it was lower than the contemporary pitch. Thus, some recorders he made in the 1920s were in low pitch, and only by the 1930s did his son started producing recorders also in modern pitch. Around that time, in the early days of the Scola Cantorum Basiliensis, it was not unusual to use low pitch as a more historical one. This pitch was circa A equals 410, a semitone below the standard pitch that until 1939 was in this region still 435 and not yet 440. In order to encourage students to play more in the historical pitch, the Scola made an agreement with the music store to sell students low pitch recorders at a discount. So, it seems that having the historical pitch, a semitone below the common pitch, was a rather early idea. Its real bloom, however, took place only at a later stage, when the transposition mechanisms for keyboards was introduced. According to an account by one of the important harpsichord builders in the blooming periods of the early music, this happened on 1973. For the first time, harpsichords were able to switch pitches by sliding the keyboard, and thus have the possibility of accompanying instruments either in 440 or in 415. Knowing that there are more possibilities for accompaniment, instrumentalists were encouraged to commission instruments in the lower pitch. 
In addition, it gave legitimacy to the idea of looking for other historical pitches at the distance of a semitone from one another, and this in turn extended the transposition mechanisms, allowing the usage of further pitches. Indeed, by the end of the 1970s, we already find recordings in the so-called French pitch of A equals 392, a semitone below 415. The same pitch was also connected with Roman practices of around 1700, and therefore called also Roman pitch. At the beginning of the 1990s, we find the usage of the so-called Venetian pitch at A equals 465, a semitone above 440. An exception to the pitches based on semitone grid of A equals 440 is the so-called classical pitch of A equals 430. This pitch was first introduced by Bartold Kauken in 1982 as a compromise between 422 and 440, two supposedly historical pitches from the time of Haydn. Kauken himself wrote that this pitch is no more than an average and that it is a practical compromise, but it should be by no means confused with historical truth. Kauken's statement is in fact true for all the other modern historical pitches, the French pitch, the Roman pitch, the Venetian pitch, or any other pitch. The intent of this episode is not to claim that a reference pitch is not important, or that its research is not important. Choosing an appropriate pitch, even when anachronistically normalized to today's standards, is important to all instruments and especially to singers. At the far end of the ranges, a semitone can make all the difference. And like always, we must accept the world that we live in, and the instrument that we have at hand, and make compromises, in order to achieve the best possible rendition in a given situation. In this specific case of pitch, however, it is even more difficult to speak of compromises as the regular reproduction of the same hypothetical historical pitch is simply not historical. So, you should never feel obliged to limit yourself to the modern historical arsenal of pitches. Choose the pitch that will make you and your voice or instrument be most comfortable. This is what our colleagues from the past would have done. This was our show about pitch. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. Feel free to comment, share and like, and see you next time at earlymusicsources.com.